And so I stayed there trying to work it out, trying to make something happen, trying to figure out a way to sell the company off for anything we could gain. Why well, I started the North Face originally. We started from scratch. It's now I've sold it. The F Corporation owns it. It's a $3 billion company. We never envisioned that uh, when we were doing it. I started it because I didn't fit into the standard business world that I saw out there. I believed in sustainability. I believed in triple bottom line, which is an equal commitment to the planet and to profit and to people. I believed in hiring the best. Uh, we paid women the same as men, which was heresy at that time. Uh, we hired anyone, no matter what their background was. We were just looking for the best people. And I did that because I didn't see anywhere else. So I had to start a company about something I loved and insinuating my ideas. And I love the out of doors. And I love the idea of changing the world. And so that was the, the genesis of it. We were an outdoor company at the outset. And now many people think of it as being a, a, a just clothing company, but it was an outdoor company at the beginning. And it's certainly uh, the iconic brand is well known. Uh, I would say that I'll pull it up here so you can see it. By the way, we spent all of $250 uh, to have that logo designed for us. So uh, we weren't spending a lot there. Another thing that people always ask, which I didn't uh, have about, is why did I leave North Face? Uh, and that's a question that's frequently asked. Uh, the real reason, very simply, is we grew too fast. Uh, I love basically brand building. I love visioning. I love the outdoors. I love making the best product. I love team building. And we were growing so fast, we had to refinance almost every single year. As a result of refinancing, I was spending most of my time being an investment banker. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. So after going through rounds and rounds of financing and all of that stuff, I finally one day said, I don't want this battle anymore. I'd rather go skiing. And that's what I did. So I sold it. Uh, I started in 68. I sold it in 90. Uh, subsequently, I served on a lot of boards. I've mentored a lot of entrepreneurs. I've, I've consulted with a number of companies. I've written some books, as you mentioned. The latest one is called Almost, which is about a failure. The first one is called Conquering the North Face. It was about success. Uh, I was telling him earlier, it's harder to find publishers for failure books than it is for success. They told me, look around the bookstore, you'll see there's no racks for failure. I told them, well, that's why you guys are failing. <laughs> that's why Amazon's beating you all out. But anyway, the, the, the net of it is doing all those things led me to what uh, this story today is all about. And that's basically, I spent about one fucked up year chasing a Silicon Valley dream uh, where we were almost, and I use that word advisedly, that's the name of the company, but we almost changed the world and for the better, but we fucked it up. And I guess it was my hubris from the North Face success. You know, I thought it was as easy to parachute into a company that had cutting edge patents and brilliant opinionated people and no business experience. And I thought they would just love to have my, my input. Uh, it wasn't as easy as I thought. It wasn't as easy as starting one's own company as I did with the North Face, where basically we had clear goals, a lot of people eager to learn, uh, where we actually had strategies about where we're going to go. Uh, so when I looked at it, I thought it was a piece of cake and it turned out not to be so. The, the thing that I tell a lot of people, probably the lesson I learned is never assume rational behavior from either your colleagues or your customers, uh, because what seemed rational to me didn't play out. So the company that you see, Artica, invited me in. Chances are you've never heard of the company. Uh, you almost did. It was almost really famous. Uh, they asked me to help. What this company did is make miniaturized portable power that could be put into consumer goods. And it had a roadmap starting with a product that existed, which was a, a lithium ion battery and it would go to making fuel cells, green energy, most efficient, uh, no problems with it. And had a team of really remarkable people. We had people who were graduates of Carnegie Mellon, Stanford University, had two astronauts. We had the head of the mechanical engineering department at, uh, at Stanford, all part of it. Uh, we had lots of patents and millions of dollars that all got pissed away. But they said they wanted me to come in. They wanted world-class branding and marketing. Uh, they certainly wanted uh, all of those things. But uh, what it turned out is what they wanted more than anything else was my, basically my contacts, my CV, uh, and they wanted instant riches, which they thought they would get out of it. They really wanted to uh, dress up the company, put lipstick on the pig, and that's what they were going to do. The first product 
that we produced, which I'll show you here, is basically on the left. Uh, that's the, a battery pack, which is lithium ion. It could be integrated into that jacket that you see on, on the side there. We created this, uh, used our marketers and sales. I brought in three people, uh, Sean Viega, Rich Walwood, Greg Neville, who were just great at selling. In the first year, we actually uh, sold about $12 million worth of product. I thought that was pretty good, but not everybody liked it. I'll come to the reasons why later. I mean, for one magical year, one magical year, we thought we were almost there. We were on the verge of breaking through. We were going to convert the way people live their lives, more mobility with power, and that could drive everything. This, this battery pack created heat on demand. You could have cooling ultimately if you wanted it. It would charge every device that you had. It would run every device that you had, all in this little battery pack that was rechargeable. And fuel cell was gonna be lighter and better. But what we did was screw it up. We fucked it up. And, and there are five reasons that we really did that. The first one is uh, we had the conflict in the company. Basically, the difference between you make what you can sell or you sell what you can make. The engineers never wanted to make two of the same thing. The salespeople and marketing people all wanted to sell millions of one type of unit. The guy running the company uh, was basically quite different. He brought me in, but he and I had different backgrounds. The company was divided along sales and engineering, those two uh, polar opposites. The guy ran the company who had been a commander in the Navy. He'd never worried about budgets. In fact, spend your money every year because that's how you get more money the next year. He only believed in top-down management, telling people what to do, had a total disdain for business and for civilians. And here I was, a scrappy entrepreneur that basically was a brand builder with an MBA from Stanford University. I was, you know, couldn't have been more different. I thought what he said is that he wanted what I had to offer, but he didn't. The lesson here, the reason we failed is you can't have two cultures in a business, particularly not in an entrepreneurial business. Everybody has to sit down and decide what is it that we stand for. We never reconciled the difference between the engineering mentality and the sales and marketing. The second thing that we tripped over was the fact that uh, a lot of people on the engineering side felt that invention was equal to innovation. It is not. Invention plus commercialization, you gotta sell something or you don't have any value. But the people who are on the engineering side and, and the CEO who had this background would totally believe the goal was to see how many patents we could put in our patent portfolio. And as a result of it, even though we'd started this with, I thought, fairly good sales of getting 12 million in a year, uh, they weren't really focused on that at all. And so it came to the next thing that really tripped us up. You might recognize that logo. Well, what happened is Apple came to visit and suddenly this myth of the overnight success was taking everybody away. The CEO immediately came up to me and said, you know, we're gonna sell this company by the end of the year for 50 million, hundred million dollars and had false hopes of instant riches. The, the reality is every overnight sensation takes a lot of years. And the reality also is companies like Apple don't just buy patents. And I told the CEO this and I said, it isn't going to happen. Uh, I said, because first of all, we haven't seen Steve Jobs. And I said, he makes every decision there. But, and they said, well, they've got billions in the bank. And I said, all the more reason they can wait. I said, but he said, you know, but everybody does it. That's Silicon Valley. Everybody gets rich overnight. And I said, well, maybe, but generally it doesn't work that way. Well, as part of it, he immediately discounted the product that was actually selling in the market, the lithium ion battery. And he started focusing on the fuel cells because that's what Apple had interest in. And that's where we had most of our patents. And he said that was success was going to be there. So suddenly didn't lost all business discipline. He forgot about the battery, didn't back it, created schism inside the company, said that, you know, we're just going to go ahead. We're going to spend whatever it takes to get there. Well, that came to the next problem, which is uh, when you run out of money, you make bad decisions. And in this case, we didn't have any money. And, and so the product that went to the market that you saw was one which we did not do anything more than engineering studies in the lab. What you have is in-use engineering studies you need to do. What happens after it's been out for a thousand days or whatever? Well, the CEO said, we don't have the $30,000 to do that. And we can't spend it because we're out of money. And so the reality was that we didn't spend that money. It went out in the marketplace and there was failure. 
actually some of the leads and there's sparking and arcing and all sorts of ugly things. And as a result of it, suddenly there was a recall. The Product Safety Commission did that. And we ended up with a liability of hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But then the overall thing is you failed to plan, failing to plan, knowing where you're gonna go because the CEO said there's no reason to fail uh, or no reason to worry about it because we aren't gonna fail. What we're gonna do is sell. We're gonna get 50 to $100 million. And I said, well, you know, we've got a problem, Dick. I said, we've spent $2 million more than we have in the company. The landlord is knocking on the door. You're never around because you're ducking the landlord, but he told me he's gonna put a padlock on the door and we aren't even gonna be open, even if they come around. I said, that's, that's not gonna be success. I'm 100% certain that we're gonna have a problem. And he said, well, I don't, I said, we gotta raise money. And so I don't wanna dilute everybody by bringing money in just when we're gonna sell out for $100 million. And I said, well, listen, we, we owe that money. I think I can raise five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 quickly. If we come up with a plan where we spend that money judiciously, then we can keep everybody happy. And either we'll raise more money once we're keeping people happy or we'll sell the company, as you say. And we came up with a plan. He, he was big on a number of $147,000. I was able actually to raise $700,000. I raised it in two weeks which is pretty fast, that usually doesn't happen. He didn't think it was enough uh, or fast enough, but he thought it was too much dilution. Anyway, so I went in the day after the 700,000 came into the bank and I looked at the bank account online and it said we had $46 left in the account. 700,000 the night before we had 46. So I went to the, the CFO and I said, what the fuck is going on? I said, you know, this money came in, it all went out. He said, well, the CEO said we had to spend the money. I said, the CEO was part of the plan. We will spend 147,000, keep everybody happy. I said, we don't even have enough money for payroll tomorrow. And he said, well, I left 80,000 in the bank. And I said, well, you know, the bank doesn't say that. I'll go check it out. But, you know, usually they don't make mistakes. Well, I went back, looked at it. I came and I said, well, there's, there's three checks totaling $80,000 that went to a lobbyist that uh, aren't in our check register. And he said, well, I don't know anything about it, but maybe the CEO wrote this. And I said, well, on top of that, I said, it was impossible, physically impossible for you to have sent those checks out last night for them to receive it and have it in the bank. Those checks went out long ago. You didn't tell me about it. And I was out raising all of this money and you didn't tell me what was going to happen. Well, the net of it was the company was mortally wounded. It, it went on, tried to do a few contracts and whatever, but never really happened. And, and as you might guess, there was never an offer from Apple. It didn't happen. And as a result of all this, all these dreams, we were going to change portable power. We were going to put things in, in every jacket in the world. We were going to suddenly create mobility. The company lasted a bit longer. Everybody left, but a few of the people who were developing patents went on, kept selling things, developing government grants, but it went bankrupt ultimately. So you might ask now, at what point did I realize it was going to fail? And I believe it was when I proposed having a meeting, which was a strategic planning meeting, which would reconcile the schism between the sales and marketing and the engineers. And the CEO said, I'll hold the meeting, but I won't allow those two sides to come together. At that moment, I knew that we were never going to make it. So, you know, at least kind of the second question you might ask is, is why didn't I just leave right away? Why did I stay there? Simple answer is I brought a lot of people in. I brought in the, the sales and marketing people I told you about. Uh, they uh, were best in the class, best in the field. Also, I brought in a number of investors. I brought in that $700,000. And so I stayed there trying to work it out, trying to make something happen, trying to figure out a way to, to sell the company off for anything we could gain. Uh, but ultimately I had to leave because I didn't agree with the people. I didn't think they were honest. I knew we had failed. If we raised a little bit more money, it was in trouble. So I spent most of my time trying to get some money back to the people to put in the 700,000. Now, what I would tell you is there were positives from that. This is what Pepe was talking about. You're, there's always positive from failure. Uh, there's an old saying, I mean, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. I mean, I certainly got a lot of that. I think a second thing is, is really, uh, 
it reinforced the attitude that I've had for a long time. This came from Thomas Edison saying, I've not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that something won't work. That's the attitude you have to have. It's like applying uh, the method this, to, uh, to business that is often used in science, known as the scientific method. Try some, hypothesize, try. Those things that don't work, you throw away, focus on the things that do work. And then the, the last thing I gained out of it is along with a co-writer of mine, Brian Tarsi, I wrote a book. The book's called Almost, and, and I think Joan will probably share it with you. I'd love to have you read it, but it's, it's stories. It's stories about this specific company. Uh, it is not seven habits of highly fucked up people or whatever. It's not uh, any of those. I don't believe in that rote memorization. What I believe is something that's parables and entertaining. And I think we all lear learn from these stories, whether it's Pepe's stories, whether it's Marcus's stories or others. We learn from those stories, we remember them and we can apply them in a lot better ways. So in a nutshell, bottom line, we failed. Have you ever failed in a project, career or business? Whether you have or not, you can become a Fuck Up Nights organizer in your city, company or university. Learn how at fuckupnights.com. Join the movement. Fuck up the system.